Today we're going to learn Shabbat of Kuf Chavchet. We're going to start right at the top. I'll just remind you where we're up to. We were in the Mishnah about how many baskets one can take out of a storage house. And then once we got we dealt with the issue of how much effort one can make to take these things out and not worry about flattening out the ground. In addition, there's an issue of muktzah. There might be some items there that are considered muktzah, and therefore one can't remove them. So the, we're now going to start with the list of what is the Gemara telling us? Aren't these things all obvious that they're muktzah? So why would the sorry why would the Mishnah be needing to list all these items? So starting from the very top of Kuf Chet, Ava Lo Etatevel, you can't carry out from that storage house if you have produce that you haven't yet taken trumot and masrot from. So the Gemara says, Pshita, obviously, because we've learned before, you can't take truma maser on Shabbat. It's like fixing something, like mitaken kli, which is a tolada of makebe patish, putting the final blow. And therefore, isn't that obvious that it's mukta? So lo tzricha, because remember, mukta means it wasn't ready from before Shabbat. So the Gemara says, lo tzricha betevel tavulni de Rabbanan. We're talking about an item that's only obligated in Tron and on a rabbinic level, not on a Doraita level. What would be an example of that? Shazar Oba Atzit Nakuf, that you planted it in a planter where there was no hole at the bottom. There's no hole at the bottom, then what do we say? Ah, well, then it doesn't get any nourishment from the ground, in which case, on a Torah level, you're not obligated in Trumo de Masot, but on a rabbinic level, you are. So therefore, you might have thought maybe it's not Mukta because. It's only forbidden from the, on a rabbinic level. Comes the Gemara, the, the Mishnah to teach you, even that is Mokta. Below Maser Rishon. Now, again, we're going to do this with all of the cases, basically. Maser Rishon, that you're supposed to bring to Yerushalayim, that you haven't taken. I'm sorry, the Maser Rishon, that you give to the Levi. You give him the portion, and what happened in this case? You, um, you haven't yet taken Truma from it, meaning the Levi gets the Maser, and he hasn't taken out his Truma yet. He's supposed to give a tenth of his tenth, tenth of that has to go to the Kohen. So obviously, the Gemara says, Pshita, if you haven't taken out the tenth, you're a Levi, you have this produce, you haven't taken out a tenth to give to the Kohen, of course it's Mokta, he can't eat that, so of course, so what's the Chidush? So they go back to the Chidush they said about in the previous, on the, the earlier list that was the, comp, the comparable list about the Maser Rishon, it goes back to that issue. Lo shiktimo bikri, it's where first you took the, at this case, what happened? You put the last case, if you remember, we discussed when it was just in, in uh, bundles and it wasn't yet piled up, it wasn't yet obligated in truma. So therefore, in that case, if you gave the levy before you even got to the stage where it was obligated in truma, gadola, your truma to give to the coin, then you don't actually have to give the truma. But in this case, what happened? Normally, you take out your truma gadola, 40th or one. 50th or 160th, you give it to the coin. Then after that, you take a 10th of what's left and you give to the levy. In this case, what happened? It went into the pile where you're then obligated in everything. And then you took out the maser for the levy before you did truma gadola. You did it in the opposite order. Now, what did we learn? We learned that it doesn't matter that you did it in the opposite order. The levy now has to take out the truma gadola from his portion. So, you might have thought, like our Papa suggested, which was before he, they learned from the Pasuk that said, um, So what did they learn from there? You only take Maser from the Maser, meaning Trumat Maser, but you don't have to take Trumat Gdola. So you might have thought it's like that. And then, Abaye said, no, that Pasuk is only referring to, if you remember, if you did it at the early stage, before it was even obligated in Truma Gdola. Once it became obligated in Truma Gdola, then as they call it Truma Gdola compared to the Truma Maser. Those are two different, because the Truma Gdola is on everything, and then the Truma Maser is only on the tenth that the Levi gets. So if the Levi got his tenth beforehand, he'd have to take also Truma Gdola and the Truma Maser, and that's what they're coming to teach you, that if it was Maser Rishon, that the Truma Gdola hadn't been taken from it, because, and it was once it was already in the pile where it was obligated in Trumagdola, then that would be considered mukta because it's not yet, about, you can't eat it yet. Below et maser sheni. This is maser sheni. That's the one you bring to Jerusalem. And what you normally do is you redeem it on a coin. 
or it also listed their hekdesh, something that's sanctified, that you dedicated to God. And again, you're going to bring it to the temple, but normally you don't bring it to the temple, you redeem it on a coin. So here it says, if you have Master Shani or you have hekdesh that you haven't yet redeemed. Obviously, if you haven't yet redeemed, then it's sanctified and you have to either bring it to Jerusalem or redeem it. Of course, it's going to be mukta. So the Gemara says, pshita, obviously. We're talking about a case where they were redeemed, but not in a manner that was halachic. What does that mean? What would be a case? If you took your master and you redeemed it on a coin that was a, an asimon, is a flat coin, one that doesn't have, if you remember the old asimonim, they didn't have any, they don't have a, an etching in it, right? Uh, I can't think of the word, but they're not, um, they're, they don't have any form on it. Right? Normally coins have a picture, an image, something. So if it has nothing on it and it's just flat, that's not a coin that you're allowed to use for Masir. Where do we learn that from? The Pasuk says, which means you should bind the money to your hand and bring it to the temple. But they darshan the word bitsarta as davar sheyesh botsura, something that has an engraving on it. Okay, so from here you learn that, um, so if, let's say, you did your maser and you redeemed it onto a coin without an engraving on it, then we would say that is not, that's going to be mukta because it's not valid. What about a hekdesh case? Because there it doesn't say bitsarta kesepi adecha, so that wouldn't be an issue. Well, there's another issue with hekdesh. Hekdesh shechililoa gabe karka. Let's say you redeemed it onto land. You're not allowed to redeem it onto land. You have to bring the money. So they learn from there anything that's like money. What would be like money? Something that can be moved and something that has value, inherent value to it. Whereas land is all valued. The whole issue with land being valued, we all know that land can be valued. It very much fluctuates. We don't like to do things, put things onto items that are so fluctuating in terms of their value. Also, there are times when money fluctuates in its value, but less so than land. And therefore it has to be, and it also can't be carried in your hand like money can, which again, all the more so for hectares, if you have to bring it to the temple, you obviously are not gonna be able to carry land to the temple. The lower taluf. So now they're gonna tr- teach you all sorts of things. Okay, we said, why not the loof? Because it's a ma'achal, right? Um, there's a machlok at about a loof, whether you can do it, Tanakama says, Luf, um, below it's a luf, below it's a hardal, because nobody eats them. Rabbi Shem, Rabbi Shem and Gamliel said, matir beluf, because it's a machal le orvim. And it seems that orvim, or something ravens, are something that only wealthy people have. So now we're going to talk about things that are, let's say, only, we're going to talk about different things that are worthy for animals to eat, but what if they're animals that are very rare and only wealthy people own those animals? It's a type of grass, because the deers eat it. Here you see it opposed to the Tanakam of our Mishnah. Because doves eat hardal, mustard. This is going to sound interesting. Broken pieces of glass. Because ostriches eat broken glass. I don't know why ostriches eat broken glass. I don't know if it's true, but that's what he says. And what's strange about this is most people don't grow ostriches, okay? And we're going to see that only wealthier people have ostriches. And the reason why they had ostriches were more for decorative purposes and for playing. Okay, this reminds me when I was in the Far East, we actually went ostrich riding, okay? It was kind of, and it certainly wasn't the kind of thing that got you very far. It wasn't like people use them as a way of transportation. It was more like a kind of fun activity. Some of us thought it was fun. Some of us thought it was less fun. Um, anyway, I thought it was kind of fun. But anyway, um, so he says only wealthy people have it, just like he's about the ravens. Remember, he said in the Mishnah, because it's for ravens, and since only wealthy people have ravens, still we're going to allow it. That's going to put it in the category of not mukta. So Amalei Rabbi Natan, and if you're talking about the Far East, this really reminds me of the Far East. Amalei Rabbi Natan, Elameata chavilez morot yital talum mipnei shuhuma achal pilin. He says, well, then you're going to allow bundles of um, grapevines because elephants will eat them. And then if, once you say ostriches, well, elephants, right? Obviously, many people don't, normal people don't have elephants. And in fact, there I also learned that 
it's incredibly expensive. Forget about the cost of the elephant itself, the cost of feeding an elephant. I seem to remember something like it costs $5,000 a month just to feed an elephant. So it's only wealthy people can afford to have elephants. So then you're going to allow that because it's machal pilin. So what's the answer? Rashbag namiyot shchiche pilin lo shchiche. Okay. Ostriches are more common than elephants. Okay, if you're going to have a scale, ostriches are still not so common, but they're more common than elephants, and that's why he only said ostriches and not elephants. Amar Amemar. It's kind of funny to be having this discussion in the Gemara. Amar Amemar, v'hu di'it le'namiyot. Amemar says it's only if you actually have ostriches. He doesn't mean that you can, you, that you can carry broken glass if you don't have ostriches. It's not because some people have ostriches so we can allow everybody. No, it's only if you actually have ostriches. Um, Rav Ashi la Memer. Rav Ashi disagrees with Amemar and says, then the whole discussion makes no sense. Because what did Rabbi Natan say? Um, uh, when Rabbi Natan said to Rashbag, according to you, So um, obviously what he meant there was, since some people might have elephants, then for you it should be allowed, because theoretically, people could have elephants and that could be food for elephants. So it's obviously all theoretical and therefore Rav Ashi thinks against Amemar that what Rav Shimon Gamliel really said was that since there are a few people in the world or X number of people in the world, more than elephants, let's say because elephants, so few people in the world own elephants, therefore we're not gonna allow Chavilei Zmorot, but we will allow broken glass because it's food for ostriches and there's more people, even though it's still pretty rare, there's more people who have that, that turns any broken glass into potential food for ostriches, even if you don't own it. And from here, Amar Abaye, Rashbag, the Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shmav, Rabbi Akiva, Kulu, Svira, Lehu, they all hold the same thing. We've seen this many times, and Abaye often is the author of this kind of statement, which is we're going to put all these different opinions together and say that the theory behind them is the same, which is, Kol Yisrael b'nei malachim him. Remember we said we treat, we learned this with Rabbi Shimon already, and now we're going to see also Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Kiva say it, that we, and now it also matches Rabbi Shim ben Gamliel in our case, which is we're going to treat everybody as if they're the sons of kings. Okay, so if something is relevant for sons of kings, we're going to say that that's relevant across the board. We're not, and this is an interesting theory about not treating people any differently, right? Especially because some people are wealthy. We're gonna allow wealthy people to do things and not poor people, right? We're gonna treat everyone as if they're equals. So let's see where everybody says this. Um, Rashbag Hadamaran. So Rashbag is in our sugya where he says, even if you don't own, again, depending on how you understand it, but certainly the way Ravashi understands it, and obviously Abaye understood it the same way, which is even if you don't own ostriches, we're gonna treat you as if potentially you could own ostriches and you're allowed to carry broken pieces of glass. Rabbi Shimon Ditznan b'nei malachim sachim al gabe makotehen shemen beret, shekein darkan b'nei malachim lasuk b'chol. So the Tanakama there in the Mishnah said that the sons of kings put Shem and Beret on their, on their wounds because they normally use Shem and Beret, the, the oil from roses. They normally use that for anointing and therefore it's not clear if you remember that they're doing it for medicinal purposes. Therefore it's allowed. Rabbi Shimon disagrees with Tanakhama and says, Omer kol Yisrael b'nei malachim him, and therefore everyone can do it, not just the sons of kings. Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva, where do they say it? Dutanya haresh hayu noshim bo elef maneh. If somebody, they came to collect a loan of a thousand mane. That's a lot of money. Ulevush itzdalabat mea mana. And when they came to get the money, he didn't have the money to pay back, and he was wearing a cloak that was worth a hundred mane. Mafshitino to umabishino to itzdalaharu yalo. Okay, a hundred mane is a lot, a lot of money. Okay, so now it's a hundred dinarim. So if you're going to say now a hundred, it's um, one second, a hundred mane is right. A mane is a hundred dinarim. So 100 mane is 100 times 100 dinarim. So, mafshitino to mabushino to itzlaru yalo. You take off his cloak, and what do you do? You give him a cloak that is worthy of him. Meaning, this very interesting law, if you're going to take something away from a poor person because he owes you money or any person, you can't leave them with less than what they would normally walk around with. So what do we do? We take off his cloak. We take the money from there to pay back the loan, but we make sure to replace it with a cloak that someone of his stature would wear. 
So now, Tana Mishum Rabbi Yishmael, but Tana Mishum Rabbi Akiva, there was a bright to both the neighbor Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Akiva, which is interesting because they're always argue with each other. But in this case, they agree. Kol Yisrael ruigin lo ta itzdala. Meaning, we treat everyone the same. If this is what he's wearing, then it must be that it's right away for him, in which case you cannot take his cloak off his body and give him something less. Okay? And therefore, you have to give him something according to his stature. Chavilei kash ve and now we're back to the Mishnah. The Mishnah had listed Chavilei Kash, Chavilei Etzim, Chavilei Zradim. Im Yitzkinel Namachal Behema Metaltalinotam Ve'im Lav E Metaltalinotam. These are issue. These are items that normally you would burn. You would use for burning purposes, for a fire, for kindling your fire. If you use these and you designate them before Shabbat for food for your animal, then you can carry them. And if not, then you can't. So Tano Rabbanan, the bright, they now quote a bright ta. Chavilei kash v'chavilei etzim v'chavilei zradim. Im itkina l'machal behema metaltalin otam. Vim lav e metaltalin otam. That's exactly what we saw in the Mishnah. Rashba gomer, chavilim anitalim biyad achat, mutar letaltal. V'shte adayim asur letaltalan. He now adds another thing. If these bundles are so heavy that you have to carry them with two hands, then you're not allowed to carry them. And that seems to be because it's an, it's an effort. Too much effort on Shabbat. Remember, that's what we started with Mufani. How many you can take out? Isn't it a big effort that you're making? Chavilei se'a ezo v'koranit. This is savory, hyssop, and thyme. Hichnisan le'etzim. If you meant to use them for kindling purposes, e'em estapet mehem b'shabbat l'machal b'hema. Sorry, e'em estapet mehem b'shabbat. You can't take anything. If you set them aside for kindling, you can't take from there and use them on Shabbat. But if you set them aside for your animal to eat, what else can you do with these piles? Now we're off on a bit of a tangent. You can cut them with your hand as long as you don't do it with a utensil. Seems to be that the issue here is tochen, cutting up something. And if you remember, Rashi quotes us this issue. Tochen is normally with a mortar and pestle. But if you cut something into very small pieces, it's also a problem of tochen. So now they say, well, you could do it by hand. You just can't do it with a, with a utensil. Umoleo v'ochel. Okay, it's a bit of a debate what this is. Moleo is to rub something in between your fingers. Now, moleo v'ochel. Now, what's the issue? Probably you're trying to separate the grain from inside the stalk. So that we know is a tolada of dash, okay, which is the threshing. So they say here, Molel v'ochel, you can do it like one by one, do it in, with your fingers and put it in your mouth. It sounds like, you know, there's different versions of this text, but I'll read it the way it says it in, by us, which is, as long as you don't do it in a utensil a lot at a time, which seems to imply that if you do it with a utensil that's specialized for this purpose, but you don't do a lot at a time, then it's allowed. Now, this is strange because dash in general, there's certain things that you can do biyad and apokli. Remember, we learned about borer. But dash is not one of those things that generally you can do, you know, with, your, with a kli, even if you're not doing a lot at a time. So some people think that that's what it means. Some people have a different gear set. It says, um, sorry, I lost my place. Ubavad shalo yimlo bikli, period, without the word harbe, meaning you can do it by hand, you can't do it with a utensil. And then that answers the question. Some people answer that the issue with milila is not separating like the wheat from the chaff or the grain from inside, but it's actually crushing it to soften it. And then it's more probably a toladav, tochen, of grinding something because you're crushing it into small pieces rather than dash, which would actually be a problem if you were doing dash. So that's Divrei Rabbi Yehuda. Chachamim omrim, molel b'rashay etzbaotav, you can use the tips of your fingers to do it, ve'ochel, and eat, u'bavad shalo yimlo b'yado harbe, k'derek shu'o sebecho. He says you can't even do melila a lot at a time with your hand. Okay, that's even an issue because that's the way people normally do it on Shabbat, on, on a regular day. V'chein ba'amita, v'chein ba'kei, pegam v'chein b'sh'ar minei tavlinim. And likewise with all different types of spices. My amita, so what are these spices they're mentioning? Nina, that's nana, okay, mint. Se'a, amra vihuda, satre. Satre is savory. Ezov, avarta, that's hyssop. Koranit, kornita shma, that, that's, its, that's its only name. 
So now they say, what do you mean? Aha, yidam alu, mam bai kornita. Someone came and asked, who has kornita? Ve'ishka chashe, and they gave him chashe. So what do you mean? It's only called kornita. We also know it by the name chashe. Obviously, it doesn't help us, but it means time. Ela se'a sitre ezov abarta and kornita chashe. Okay, so in fact, we say that these are what they're all identified as. Okay, and that was just a tangent we got off on because we were talking about using spices for you know things that are spe- that are set aside as machal behemah, and then we talked about all sorts of other things one can do with them by hand, not with a kli or not a lot, etc. Itmar. We're continuing now in all sorts of things that are considered muktz or not foods. Basar maliach. Note that all these things, obviously, we're talking about foods because we're talking about in the storage house. What kind of food items can you move away? Um, okay, so now. Itmar, basar maliach mutar letaltalo b'shabbat. Basar tafel, Rav Huna amar mutar letaltalo, Rav Chista amar asur letaltalo. Salted meat, since it's worth, people can eat salted meat even if it's not cooked, therefore one can carry it on Shabbat because one can eat it. But unsalted meat can't be eaten on Shabbat. So there's a machloket. Can you carry it or can't you carry it? Now, it seems weird. Why would you be allowed to carry it? if we don't eat it. So two possible reasons. Either maybe there are some people who eat their meat unsalted. Yeah, obviously you have to deal with the issue of the blood because we don't only salt the meat for taste, we also salt the meat because you have to get the blood out. So there's ways, there's ways that one could eat unsalted meat without getting the blood out that we're gonna leave aside. But the other possibility is that you could give it to your dog. Now, normally, here comes a good example. We've had things like this before. Normally when you eat, when you eat meat, I'm sorry, normally when we talk about mukta, we talk about there's a general use for it and there's a less general use for it. So let's say this, we talked about when we talked about carrying items outside your house and what do, if there's a common use and a less common use, so do we go by the common use or the less common use? So this is the same idea. Normally your meat, you're gonna be eating yourself, but if it's unsalted, your dog could potentially eat it, even though you probably won't feed it to your dog because you're probably gonna eat it yourself. So therefore, since it's potentially edible for your dog, even though you really weren't designating it for food for your dog, would we say that you can carry it? And that's what Rapuna says. Rapuna says you can carry it. Now he obviously holds like Rabbi Shimon, who has a very lenient definition of muktza, whereas the opposite opinion, Rabbi Chista, is holding like Rabbi Yehuda, who holds that if it's not really ready, then it's going to be muktza. So now they're going to question that. The Harav Huna Talmid Rav Hava, but he was the student of Rav. And what do we know? Rav ke Rabbi Yehuda Sfira Le to eat Le Muktza. Rav holds like Rabbi Yehuda as a bigger, a wider definition of what comes in the category of Muktza. So what do we answer? And here goes back to something we learned in the very beginning, which is good to review because I don't know if you'll remember. Be Muktza la Achila Sever la ke Rabbi Yehuda uba Muktza la Tal Tal Sever la ke Rabbi Shimon. There's a difference between something Muktza that we want to eat and something Muktza that we want to carry. Okay. When, why is that? We talked the other day about the reasons the Rambam gave for muktza versus the Raivet. Remember the Rambam said, because we want your Shabbat to be different. We don't want you to end up spending your whole day organizing things in your house and moving things from place to place and things like that. The Rashba said, right, he had three different reasons, all kind of outgrowths of that or similar. The Raivet said the issue is it's a geder, a boundary, so that you don't come to carry outside your house. But there was another thing that we talked about in the beginning of the Masechet, which is that some people learn the source for muktzah. Now they're talking about carrying muktzah items, but there's an issue of eating, not eating things that weren't prepared from before Shabbat, prepared for eating, like your, your food that you didn't take Trumat Masra from, Tevel, or things like that. Things that were on a tree and then fell on Shabbat. All those things were not ready from before Shabbat. And that was learned out one cannot eat muktzah items is learned out from the man. If you remember, it says by the man, when they got the man in the desert, it was said, they prepared what they gathered on Friday, meaning everything was prepared before Shabbat. So therefore, they learned from there that it's forbidden to eat any item that wasn't prepared for eating. It doesn't just mean cooked. It could be raw things that weren't ready for eating from before Shabbat. So therefore, we make this distinction. Since that comes from the Torah and everything else in Muktzah doesn't come from the Torah, therefore we're going to say, the Muktzah Lachila, he's more machmir, he holds like Rabbi Yehuda. So one can't eat these things if they weren't prepared beforehand. This basar, if you have unsalted meat and you want to eat it, you can't eat it on Shabbat. But the Muktzah Lataltel, if we're talking about carrying it, then Savalach Rabbi Shimon. So this machloket they're now saying between Rafuna and Rapista must be only about Lachila and not 
for um, tilt tool. Okay, and that's why he says, um, sorry, it's uh, my mistake. It's talking about tilt tool, and that's why Rav Huna is matir. It's not talking about eating it. When it comes to eating, he would hold like Rabbi Yehuda that it would be forbidden. Rav Chista Mara So now we're going to ask a question. Rav Chista, who forbids it? So Rav Yitzhak Bar Ami came to the house of Rav Chista and saw him. What was he doing? He took a duck and he carried it from the sun to the shade to protect it from getting spoiled. He said, this is going to be a financial loss and therefore you can move it. So how could you do that? Wasn't it unsalted meat? So they say, You can actually eat it raw, and therefore it's different than a normal case. In other words, this is a unique case, whereas most meat would not be the case. So yeah, obviously the, the animal was dead. Okay, the duck was dead. Not animal, the duck. Anyway, it was dead. So now there's a bright tip about this. If it's salted fish, again, if it's salted, you'll eat it. If it's not salted, you're not going to eat it. And therefore, so the taltalo. Therefore, you can't even carry it. Vasal, but meat, bain tafelu, bain maliach, mutar le taltalo. So this, stomach Rabbi Shimon, this obviously holds like Rabbi Shimon because it says even if it's not salted meat, one can eat it. Um, sorry, one can move it. Okay, and the reason one can move it again, again, either because maybe there's some people who would eat it or it, you could give it to your dog. Tanu Rabbanan, and now we're going to see all sorts of things that because you can give them to your animals, they're not muksa. Mitaltalina ta atzamot, mipneshu ma'achal leklavim. If you have bones, since dogs can eat it, you can move it. Masar tafuach, spoiled meat, mipneshu ma'achal lechaya. Because even though a dog might not eat spoiled meat, but other animals would eat spoiled meat. Mayim migulim, this is an interesting one. Water, one is not allowed to leave water open overnight. There's concern that a snake put its venom into the into the water. But there is one species that can eat, that can drink this water, and that's a chatul. A chatul apparently is immune to the venom of a snake. I was thinking it sounds like Harry Potter, right? That the, that the cats have these magical powers and somehow everyone else isn't, but just the cat is immune to it. So anyway, that's what they believe. This is what are you talking about? You can't carry this Mayim Megulim because a cat won't get, won't, uh, won't die from the venom of it, but you can't have that water around because it's dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Think about it. If I see a cup of water I don't know necessarily was left out overnight, I'll come and just drink that water. It looks the same whether it has the venom or doesn't. So therefore, the venom is obviously something you can't see. So I, as he says, don't make sure not to have that stuff in your house because of danger, and therefore, obviously, you can't carry it. Unless, of course, you're carrying it to get rid of the danger. But then it would be allowed maybe because of muksa, because of dangerous, right? Like let's say broken glass you can't carry, but if it's all over the floor and someone's going to step on it and get glass in their foot, then obviously you can move it. New Mishnah. Kofin et asal efrochim ya'alu v'yardu. I want you to remind you that animals are generally considered muksa, especially a new efroch, they can't do anything, you know, they're considered muksa. But here we're going to allow you to carry something for something muksa, if you remember. Generally, you can't carry a kli for something that's muktza, right? If there's something that's already muktza, you're not allowed to carry a kli to help that. We learned that already. But here you're allowed to carry this basket for the chicks so that they can go up and down, okay? It's in order for them to get where they need to get to so they can go up and down on this, um, on here. And the issue is, why are we allowing? All the things in the mission are allowed either because of tsar balei chayim, you have to treat animals humanely and help them if they're suffering, or because if it's a financial loss. Okay, if we're going to lose those chicks, they're going to walk away. We want them to stay here, so we put a little clay so that they can get up maybe into their nest or wherever they're going. Tarnagol shebarcha. If you have a, a hen that runs away, so again, you want to either, you're concerned that the hen might get trampled on by something outside, in the outside world, or you want the hen to get back into your, into your property. You can prod it along, push it, okay, so that it goes into your house. You can't carry it because you can't carry, but you can push it along. Madidin agalinu siachim. You can help agalim, young um, calves and and uh, I forget the word for siachim, 
full, you can help them. Pro okay, now here, this is more than pushing. Pushing is not really moving them. You're just pushing them. Madidim is, a, is more work. You're actually kind of prodding them along. Okay, so you're helping them to, to walk. You're probably like holding them in some way, like you're holding their leg and helping their leg to walk rather than just pushing. So if you notice in the Mishnah, you're allowed to do this for agalim and seachim, for calves and young donkeys, but you're not allowed to do it for tarnagolot, for hens. We're going to see why in the Gemara. Isha madidait bina. If you have a young child who's having trouble walking, you can also madidim, you can help them walk. We're going to see exactly to what extent. This is Rabbi Yehuda says, I'm Rabbi Yehuda in Matai. In which case can you do it? It's when you take one foot and lift it up and the other foot is still on the ground. But if you're dragging the child and the child isn't walking at all, that's not allowed, right? You get stuck in a place without an Arab and your kid just won't walk. So you can't drag the kid, but you can kind of help them along to walk by holding one foot, helping move one foot as long as the other foot is still on the ground. Otherwise, it's kind of considered carrying. And that's what we're going to see the problem becomes with the, with the hen also, that if you're not careful, the hen might kind of, we'll see in the Gemara, I'll kind of give it away, but the hen will jump up and then you'll end up carrying the hen. And that's why it's a problem. But that won't really happen with calves or young donkeys. So the Gemara starts off with a statement in the name of Rav. Just like the Kofine Tassal Lefnei Afruchim Kedeshi Aluvi Yardu, is like this other case, an animal falls into an aqueduct. And you want to help the animal get out of there, they're stuck. So you could bring blankets and pillows, stick them in the water, and you put it underneath the animal. You kind of make a ramp for the animal to get up. So today they say, wait, this contradicts the following source. This is just like the case of you remember the Otova Epino that fell into a pit on Yom Tov? So only on Yom Tov you were allowed to take them out because you could check them. On Shabbat, you're not allowed to. So, and here, if you remember, what did we say? The one that you're not allowed to take out even on Yom Tov, what do you do? You give it food in the board so that it won't die. So here it says also, if your animal fell into an aqueduct, you give it food where it is, and but you leave it till after Shabbat. Sounds like Parnasa'in, that you can only do that, it sounds like you can't put blankets and pillows to allow the animal to walk out. So they answer, It depends what the situation is. If there's a way that you can just give it food and it'll survive till after Shabbat, then do it that way. If you can't, then you're allowed to help it get out by putting these karimu kisato. right? So if not, maybe karimu kisato, and you can put underneath. They were on the first wide line now. But aren't you, now here's another problem, which we'll, we'll go back in a minute and talk about with the Efrochim, why that's not an issue. You're basically creating a situation where the Kli will no longer be allowed to be a Kli. If I throw those Karim and Kisatot, those blankets and pillows into the water, they're no longer going to be usable to me on Shabbat. Why? Well, first of all, they're going to be waterlogged. If they're waterlogged, if I take them out and they're waterlogged, I'm not allowed to squeeze them out. So basically, because that's Chita. So now I'm not going to be able to use these on Shabbat at all. So they say, how can you do that? Now with the Efrochim, you could say also, if you're making it as a ramp or as a you know, way for the Efrochim, the chicks, to start climbing on, why is this not Mevatel Kli Mechano? Because when the chicks are on it, you can't move that Kli anymore because the chicks are mooked, so you can't move the chicks. But there, the assumption is the chicks are going up and down and they're not going to be on it all Shabbat. So as soon as they're off of it, you can actually use the utensil. So it's not actually canceling it from being a utensil. Now, why is canceling something from being a utensil that could be used on Shabbat a problem? So there's actually an interesting debate. One opinion says it's a tolada of sotel, because creating a kli is bone. If you say there's binyan bekelim, remember we saw a machloket, but you're creating something. And by making this not useful for you on Shabbat, you're kind of canceling it out. You're breaking it. It's like as if, it's as if you broke it. So some people say it's soter. Some people actually say, interestingly, it's bonet. You're building. Why are you building? Well, to be mevatel kli mehechano, what are you doing? You're basically putting it somewhere where it's going to end up being there for all of Shabbat. That's as if you attach something to the ground, which is usher because of bonet, building. So theoretically, by putting something that's not going to be moved all of Shabbat, it's almost as if you built something, in, you built it into its place. So some people say it's interesting that it's itself in the opposite. It's either bonet or sotel. 
So now they say to help this animal out of the water, why do we allow you to throw these pillows and, and, uh, and blankets into the water when you're basically rendering them useless? So what do they answer? Savar Apparently he holds that this is only usher on a rabbinic level. And why does that matter? Sar chayim de oraita. Having animals suffer, like these animals that are stuck in the water, is de oraita, that you're supposed to help animals prevent them from suffering. And therefore, the tsar ba'alei chayim, that's a de'oraita chayuv, overrides the de'rabanan, uh, the canceling the kli from being a kli. Now, where does it say tsar ba'alei chayim in the Torah? This is also interesting. Two potential sources. One is, it says, if you see uh, an animal suffering under a heavy load, azov tazovimo, you have to help the animal with the load. That's one possibility. Another is lo tachsom shor show when the animal is, th- is on the threshing floor, you can't muzzle the animal and you can't prevent them from eating. So that's also preventing tzar ba chayim. So two sources where we see it comes from the Torah. Okay, back to our hen. Tarnagolat shabarcha. So what does it seem to imply here? Dochin in madidin lo. Right, that you can only push it, but you can't help it along by holding its, one of its feet. This is, also appears in the following Brayta. You can do this madidim, helping them walk along in all kinds of animals and birds, but not in your own courtyard, but not a tarnagolet. Tarnagolet, my time alone, why not? Because the tarnagolet will jump up and you'll end up carrying it. Tanechada, there's one Brayta that says, Okay, you could do it in the courtyard, but not in the public domain. But when it comes to a child, she can even do it in the public domain, and all the more so, obviously, in a courtyard, if you can allow it in the public domain, even in a courtyard, because again, it's not for you just carrying. For the animal, we're more careful, and we don't allow it in the public. Another writer says, now, if we talk about a scale of what we can allow, we talk about dochim pushing, that's less. Madidim is next. Now we're going to talk about okrim, which is kind of uproot, like to pick it up. So, you can't pick them up in the chatzir, because remember, animals are muktza. That's why they're a whole issue in the chatzir even, because in a chatzir you can carry, but you can't carry things that are muktza. So, like a child's not muktzah, but animals are muktzah. Aval dochim behem shikansu, but you can't push them. Now, here we have a bit of a problem because it talked about two extremes. You can't okrin, you can dochin, but what about madidin? So they say hagufakashia, the middle case, creates a problem because amart enokrim, it sounds like enokrim, aval, go down one level and you can do that, which is aval deduye madidin. You can help it along. Hadar Amar, but then you said dochin, you can be push it, which sounds like dochin, yes, in madidim lo, but that you can't help it along. So Amar Abai, Sefa Atan Latarna Golet. He said the end part when it says dochin is talking specifically about the hen. The hen can only be pushed and not helped along, whereas everything else can be helped along. Amar Abai, now that we're talking about Tarna Golot and how they move around, we're going to talk about a totally different halacha, which has to do with shechita, which is Haiman de Shachi Tarna Golet, if you're shechting a hen. Lichbeshinu lekare ba'ara, hold down its legs into the ground, inami nezal de medayal, medal, or hold them up entirely off the ground, because if you don't do one or the other, what might happen? Dilma manaklu the torfe ba'ara, it might stick its claws into the ground and will move while you're shechting it. Ba'akale le simanim, and the simanim, the kanan, the veshet, the two simanim that you're supposed to slaughter, you might actually, they might end up getting cut or severed before you actually slaughter them, which would render the animal a trefa. And therefore, you're not, you should be very careful because they squirm a lot. And that's why it's brought up here because we're talking about them squirming. In New Mishnah, this gets all into childbirth and helping animals with birth and, and midwives and all that. And what can be done on Shabbat? Very interesting. Mishnah, you can't help, give birth, help an animal give birth on Yom Tov um, and even on Shabbat, obviously. Um, okay, so debate. Is this Durabanan or Doraita? Is it Durabanan? And the issue is Tircha Yetera, it's just work that doesn't necessarily need to be done. You know, it's hard work. Or is it Mitakin that you're fixing something and you're not allowed, you're kind of making this 
animal be born, that's kind of tikkun kli, and then it would actually be doraita, mishum akebe patish. Aval misa'adinu miyaldina ta'isha b'shabat, but you can help, and you can even, you know, actually do the birth, help with the birthing of the woman on Shabbat. Bikorim lachachama mimakom lamakom, you can even call a midwife to come from, an, from a different city, okay, meaning you can be mechalel Shabbat for the midwife to come to help this woman give birth. Now, we just seem to say that, so we're going to have to say, what is this adding? That you can desecrate the Shabbat for this woman who's giving birth. You can tie the umbilical cord. You can even cut it. This is a lead into the next parak, which is our next Mishnah, which starts off about all sorts of things you could do for a Brit Milah on Shabbat. So Rabbi Lezer says, I'm sorry, uh, Rabbi Yossi says, you can do any things that need to be done for the Brit Milah on Shabbat. Ketzad b'sa'adim. How does one help? Okay, what does it mean to help the labor along? Rabbi Yehuda Omer, ocheze tavlad shelo yipol aretz. You grab the baby that's coming out so that it doesn't fall on the ground. Rav Nachman Amar, docheik babasar. No, you can even do more, pushing the flesh in order to help kodesh yitze havlad. Okay, in order to help, to actually physically do something on the woman's body to help the, the fetus come out or the baby come out. Tanya Kavateja Rav Yehuda. Now there's a bright to support Rav Yehuda. Okay, so you grab the baby, right? You catch it as it's coming out, so it won't fall on the ground. You can also breathe into its nose. These are things to do when the baby's born. I guess they were worried if the baby's not breathing well, maybe. You can help it to nurse. Um, I guess, again, it's a tircha issue. I'm not sure why that would even be a question, but obviously you can do it anyway. Okay, Rashbag now says, we can also help out a kosher animal. Um, one second, let me just check something. Amy Yaldin. Ah, right. Oh, ah, I read the Mishnah wrong. Someone corrected me. Thank you. Okay, let's go back to the Mishnah. I read it. I, I did the punctuation wrong. It says, Amy Yaldin et biyom tov haval misa'adin, period. I read it wrong. You can't help birth the animal, but you can help it. And now what the mission, what the Gemara was talking about is how can you help it? So you catch the, the animal as it's coming out. Sorry, my mistake. I have to reread the whole thing. Catch the animal as it's coming out or help it to nurse or blow into its nostrils. Okay. And then he's, so this, we're still in animals now. Rashbat says you can even have Rachamim on a behemat Torah, on a kosher animal, the Yom Tov. What does this mean? What can you do? This is a crazy idea. If the animal's not nursing its young, so what do you do? You take salt, right? Salt on a wound is very painful. You put it where the baby, where the, where the, where the animal came out, and to remind the mother of the pain of labor, and that will remind the mother to nurse her young. You can pour from the from the amniotic fluid on the animal so that the mother will smell it and will have rachamim. Now, why behemat Why only a kosher animal? This is an interesting also. Um, the behemot non-kosher animals don't do that to their young. They don't ignore them. They'll always nurse them. And the imarach kavlada. And if for some reason they don't, lo mikarva. Once they don't, they won't. Even if you put salt on their wound and you remind them and you pour the, I mean, I feel like they're not gonna. Once they don't nurse, they won't nurse at all. I don't know where they get that from, but that's their assumption. Mialdin etaisha. So mechtetan ale mialdin etaisha v'kumim lachachamam imakom lamakom umechalin ale et shabbat latu yemai. So why does it then need to tell you you can desecrate the shabbat? It's obvious. So her friend can light a candle for her, even if she just needs light. Okay, not something that you would think is so important for her health, but you can light a candle for it to be more comfortable for her. If she needed oil, her friend can bring it in her hand, not in a utensil, but in her hand. If she can't carry enough in her hand, she puts oil in her hair, and then the, um, and then she'll basically take the oil from her hair and put it on the friend. If she can't get enough in her hair that for what the woman needs, only then can she do it in a normal way and carry it with a utensil. So you have to do it with some sort of shinoi, some sort of change. So now they go back to that line. 
pshita. Isn't it obvious if she needs a candle, then she needs a candle. She needs to see that's, that's important for her health. So they say, even if she's blind. You might have thought, since she can't see the light anyway, it's forbidden. We see that light is even good for the blind person, make her feel more comfortable. Why? She knows that there's people with her. So she knows that if there's light, she knows that they'll be able to help her properly. If it's all dark in the room and no one else can see, even though she can't see, it doesn't really matter. But other people need to see so that they can help her. So that will give her nacha ruach. It'll make her feel better. That's already allowed. Last part for today. So typically, isn't that a problem? She's going to put oil in her hair. Squeeze the oil out when she gets to her friend. That's squeezing. That's forbidden to do. There's no problem with schita b'se'ar. Two potential reasons. Number one, schita has to be absorbed into something for us to say you can't squeeze it out of something. And oil doesn't get absorbed into the hair. Hair is not an absorbent item. That's what they say. Or normally schita is taking something out from within something. And this isn't really within something. So therefore, that's not an issue. Rav Ashem, or Afilu Tami Yesh Schita B'Seir, even if you say yes, it doesn't actually mean what I thought, what I explained, which is you put the oil in your hair, squeeze it out, and then give it to your friend. No, it means Meviala Kli Derech Sarah. She kind of weaves into her hair a basket or a little jug with oil in it and gives it to her friend. To come to Efshel Shinui Mishanina, we try to have you change in any type of way possible. Okay, we'll stop here for tomorrow because this starts something that's going to be a machloka between. Um, two different opinions about at what stage are you allowed to desecrate Shabbat for a woman who is giving birth? Like until what stage of birth are you allowed to desecrate Shabbat? And here we'll end for today and have a good day.